My father is Mexican, my mother is from the United States, uh, and they met in Mexico, in Guanajuato, um, in 1972, and then uh, they went to travel uh, to, to Europe, and then I was born in Barcelona in 1979, but by a coincidence only. And then we went back to Mexico right away, and, uh, and then because my mother is from the United States, I have been sometimes living in the United States, uh, and I, at some point I studied a um, documentary workshop at the film school in Cuba. That was very nice. Yeah. That's so, it. Uh, mm. So, but national, like national cinema, does it mean anything to you or do you feel like an international? I feel like a, a Mexican filmmaker, I think. I want to make movies in Mexico about the subjects here. But because I'm from here, that's where I feel like I'm from. You know? Even though I was born somewhere else and uh, my parents are from different countries. Um, but those things also, I think, have helped me to have a different view of Mexico in here. You know? One, I mean, living here, I live in Mexico. Uh, sometimes I have lived away. Um, and it's always very nice to be away and to think of the place and, and to come back with that energy. That's always nice. But yeah, I, uh, of course, I'm not a nationalist and, and anything. I, I think, but I do think that Mexico has a lot of uh, uh, richness in the, in many things, and also dramatic richness. You know, that is very good for movies. I think. <laughs>
they're quite international already, you know. So they they assume and they have people have lived similar experience everywhere. Even in Germany, for example, with my last film, which was about immigration, Los Bastardos, uh, in Germany, there's that subject. I could have maybe made the movie in Germany, you know, because there's this very similar subjects of immigration from one country that is. Uh, in uh, struggling economically to another country. In my case, in the film was United States. In, in Germany, it could be from Turkey to Germany or something like that. No, so in that way they could identify. But also, there's a lot of elements that maybe are seen differently uh, outside of Mexico. And, and now in my new film, I think uh, the the level of violence that I show in my new film uh, is much more comes out much more outside of Mexico. It, it, you know, it, it um, how do you say it? It shows up much more when you see it as a someone that doesn't live in Mexico, and maybe it distracts more in, in some way. But for Mexicans, I have noticed that the the level of violence and the way I show it is more integrated to the whole story that I'm trying to to tell in the film, you know, which is what somewhat of a different difference. In the Cannes press conference, I remember there was this lady. Uh, uh, telling you that she just had cancelled her trip to, to Mexico because of... What do you think of in that moment? <laughs> well, of course, at that moment, uh, I have just... It's the first encounter with anybody that's talking about my film, you know? So it's all... I'm not sure of anything yet, you know? So somebody tells me that they cancelled the trip because of my Mex of my movie uh, to Mexico. I bet I became a little bit worried, maybe, <laughs> you know? That somehow it was going to become something else, the, the film. But I think uh, it was a bit of a... Um, she, this person, the uh, film critic, she actually liked the film. She was just trying to give it a, a, put a point of how strong she felt of the, the, the way the movie felt towards Mexico, I guess, you know. And, um, but yeah, yeah, and then the, the, the director of Imcine at that point, uh, Jorge Sanchez, he stood up there and he defended the film and said that uh, he thought it was necessary to make uh, such a view of Mexico because it's something that is a big part of Mexico now and it's a problem that exists and it would be wrong to shut our eyes to it, uh, you know, just for economic purposes of tourism. That wouldn't be fair to anybody. You know. I've been working on Heli for uh, five years now, um, since the moment I started to write the story up to now, basically. And my three movies, they always come to me uh, kind of in an organic way, you know. I don't, I don't have to think so much, what am I going to do now, what subject I'm going to tackle. It always seems to be like there's nothing else I really can do or think of, and that's the movie that comes out. So far I'm happy with that process because it really uh, it doesn't feel forced to me, you know, at least. And it's uh, always been obvious what I have to do. Um, I wrote this screenplay with a friend, Gabriel Reyes, who uh, we, we just worked on a story and then grabbed elements from real life, uh, from the news, from stories we would hear. Um, from the way we see things are in, in specifically, well, I'm from Guanajuato, which is a smaller city uh, five hours away from Mexico, uh, which is very different than Mexico City. Mexico City it would be more of an international city and we're uh, much more liberal, let's, let's say, uh, open to different things. And where I live, it's much more closed and uh, a conservative place. You know? And there's many things that happen because of this conservatism that affect everything, you know, like um, uh, children, very young children having children, you know? uh, like 12, 13 year old girls being pregnant and these ch not having abortions, of course, because it's illegal there in, in the state where I live. Uh, so they have the children and what happens to these children? And this is also what the movie and somehow uh, explores, you know. I have only come, I don't go to Guanajuato so much anymore. Oh. I should, I want to, but no. That's okay. Can you just, one of your, this one is up and one is up here. Go ahead. The other side? What's this? No, it sounds off. No, it's good. No, it's good.
Film, we see the family life, and it seems like normal. And, but um, I was wondering, um, what would you say? Are uh, Haley and uh, his family are they happy? Uh, well, my idea with the family and Ellie. And, uh, <laughs> again, I'll, I'll start again. My uh, my idea of the family in the movie uh, is that I want to give the most. Uh, I didn't want them to be too poor or too rich. Um, or, or too uh, in trouble before. I wanted to be neutral before anything happened. You know, that's why I start the film with a census uh, bureau taking that they sense the the house and they uh, ask, do you have electricity? Do you have washing machine? Do you have water? And th then we hear what they have and what they don't. And um, and so in a way, I didn't want to distract with that. You know. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I mean, nobody's happy in the world. <laughs> you can be happy sometimes, and yeah, sometimes they're happy, and there is happiness in the film with, when they fall in love and when, they, when they're loving each other and making love, <laughs> you know? um, or uh, whatever. But uh, I didn't think of, uh, are they going to be happy family or a sad family? I think it's a working family, and they have enough to live uh, comfortably. Uh, two people in the house work, so in a way I didn't want that to distract. I don't know if that answers part of the question. But, uh. And um, <coughs> your choice uh, of the, the main uh, characters, uh, is it also a reflection of that, or uh, what were you looking for? I think Armando uh, Espitia, mm. really what you just said, he somehow embodies that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, like a neutralness, no? <laughs> I guess. Yeah, it was difficult for uh, the casting process in the film. Uh, for most characters, it was not so hard. I, we, with my brother Martin and, um, and also the co-writer Gabriel, they do uh, casting for me. They help me to do casting and many other people actually help me. And they look in the street and also uh, in s theater schools and acting workshops, all this. Um, but it was, so it was easy to find most of the characters, and most of them are not actors. We found in the, in the street people that have never acted, which is the, I like that a lot. They give a, a lot of, uh, uh, they give something to me that is dif more difficult to get with, with most actors, you know, in Mexico at least. Um, and uh, so that was good, but the main character I wasn't able to find so easily. And I was really searching, I never found the person that Told, said to me clearly, this is going to be it, you know. Maybe because I had too much uh, pressure on myself and pressure on that character because it was the main character that had the name of the movie. Um, so it took me uh, quite a, a while and I, had, I didn't have the character up to uh, one week before shooting the movie, the actor, you know. Um, and then, yeah, the, I, I, I convinced myself that this uh, Armando was the correct person to to, to be in the film, you know, and I'm happy with the decision. It was just after we did this very short interview in, in Cannes that I thought it, and, and I had read that you like Fritz Lang's M, and I mm. was thinking, somehow he reminded me of Peter Lorre, <laughs> of a young Peter yeah, Lorre, yeah. with his <laughs> historic... Uh, yeah. yeah, M, uh, it is one of my favorite films, and uh, I, you know, I wish, uh, I like to show it to many people, but sometimes it's a bit long, so it's difficult to, some people get bored from it, <laughs> but I like it a lot, you know. Uh, M, uh, I think, uses, tells the story very visually, with the sound and the image working very well, and the acting and everything. And uh, that is something that uh, excites me of uh, movies, you know. And this is something I try to do in Italy, to tell the story in the most visual way possible, with, uh, without, not, not that I'm afraid of dialogue, but whenever I can tell something and move the story ahead with images, it really excites me, you know. And when I can do that uh, a few times in Italy, it happens. Uh, I like it a lot. You know? um, yeah. What is the moment you are thinking of? Uh, where you? Yes. For example, in the scene where Ellie comes back from school and the water doesn't come out from the roof, uh, and uh, his wife uh, can't take a shower because uh, there's no more water, and he goes to look in the water tank to see what's happening and he finds something there. 
uh, this sequence there, that's one example of uh, we're seeing what's happening without any dialogue, you know, and it's just happening and we're intrigued and we're moving ahead the story like that. I thought it is very elegant and also it has like a maybe metaphorical uh, quality about it. I thought mm -hmm. that like he's finding the drugs are like they're in his system mm -hmm. without him knowing it. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, I've never thought of that exactly. You know, uh, when I make my movies, I, I I am very I am kind of a very practical person. You know, so I try to tell the story in the most practical way, and and I try to shoot in the most practical way possible, and I let um, things like that, those ideas, come by themselves. You know, uh, because I'm what I am sure of is that. Uh, what I try to be sure of is that the film that I'm making will come from inside me and that I won't, uh, uh, that, that uh, it will be very uh, instinctual, let's say, you know, the, the way of, uh, of what I'm writing and what I'm trying to tell. So uh, I don't try to intellectualize so much before, you know, and I, and I hope that happens afterwards and that things surprise me, like what you say, you know, that, that's nice. Uh, Point of view. You think about it afterwards as well, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, I've, me, no. I hear it more. It's with people here, and maybe a little bit myself. But even me, I don't try to, uh, I, if, because it feels a little bit strange to after I make it to try to connect things and make something that I wasn't uh, um, so much pretending to do, you know, in a way. So. Um, I trust those things to the audience uh, that they'll see new things in the film and 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 yeah and, exp and go deeper than what I was able to even put together maybe you know mm -hmm. I don't know. But uh, Amanda, what what do you think? Uh, what did he bring to the character? Well, um, Armando, he was, you know, he he convinced me to to be in the film. Uh, what I mainly I have noticed many times I do with my main characters. I find them and sometimes they're very different. They, the look that they have is very different. So what I did with him was cut his hair uh, because he had very long hair and he wore glasses also. So it was difficult to tell if he was going to be uh, correct or not in a visual way at least. So I did that and then um, he went to live in the town for a while, for 10 days before the movie started or more maybe. Um, no, um, actually he lived one week before the film and one week during the filming. He lived in this town, in that house. And that made him become very, uh, to learn of the, the place and, and to, he was pale because he's from Mexico City. So the sun wasn't hitting him so much like in this town. So we, he became much more like what I thought the character should be, at least physically. And then, um, with his actions, I think he br he brought uh, you know this uh, bit something delicate and fragile in a way, uh, but also like steady and forward, you know, and direct. Uh, that he was, uh, yeah, like that, something like that. I think. And Andrea Vergara, how did she convince um, you? Um, Andrea, who's uh, the uh, Estela in the, in the movie, she, uh, my brother Martin found her in the in, in the street. He, he she was walking around with her family, and uh, visually she really uh, was uh, interesting to me. You know, her eyes, uh, very expressive eyes without saying anything, um, and she was very intelligent, and uh, she was also able to to cry uh, with tears uh, if I ask her every time, you know, <laughs> which is somewhat of a, a talent, I think. And she was very smart uh, of everything and she never complained and uh, very professional and she had never acted or anything in her life. So I was very pleased with her and uh, yeah. And um, would you say that the, this very special landscape is also like a, like a character in the film? Mm -hmm. well, the, the landscape in Ellie is uh, basically where I walked around to think of the movies that I make. Uh, I live five to ten minutes away from everywhere that I shot the film. Um, and I, it's the landscape that I grew up in. And I like it and uh, it gave me also more freedom for framing, you know, these wide uh, landscapes. My other movies are very interior. There's mostly no exteriors, uh, uh, at least no, countries, no countryside exterior. So here, uh, because part of the inspiration of the film also came 
from the landscape in the sense that uh, about 20 years ago in Mexico, the General Motors company came and they made a big factory, very big, where they assembled many of the cars that go to the United States. Um, and so because of that, many p families went, were attracted you know, uh, to the area and made new towns and new families, new houses uh, because of this factory. You know? And I wanted to, to that attracted me and I wanted to film and to make a story of a family from that area which is in a way the, has something to do with the landscape in a way because it, at the same time they changed very much the landscape you know so when I think of the landscape I also think of the inspiration of the film which is something that happened in the landscape in a way you know? I think in the film the way that I show the violence has to do with also the way that I have, uh, well, that in Mexico we perceive and see violence in the media also. From always, you know, from when you're very little, you, there's many images in the newspapers, uh, many, there's actually some magazine called Alarma that has all dead bodies uh, that have been killed or by car crashes or run over by cars. So I think in Mexico we have a particular way of looking at, at death uh, visually, you know, in a, in a morbid sense, uh, and I think that I'm sure reflects how I show it also, you know, as it has affected me, I'm sure, um, because the way I want to show it also is uh, similar to that, you know, but uh, I, I am not so, I, I don't like those magazines very much because uh, they, it's basically pornographic, that, that magazine, you know. What I w try to do is go beyond that, uh, in a way, and uh, besides showing the leftover of that violence, I wanted to show when that violence happens. Uh, because we're very used to seeing, for example, uh, headless bodies uh, or bodies hanging from a bridge. And those images are in the newspaper, no? We see them and it's very sh it's shocking and unpleasant and et cetera to see it. But and somehow it feels like a ghost did that or a monster did that, you know? And, and as long as you don't run, run into these ghosts or monsters, nothing's going to happen. So in my movie, I wanted to, sh to go and explore that place where that happens, you know. Um, and, and which, that's what also makes many people um, react badly toward the movie because uh, it's very sad, that part, and very, um, I don't know if shocking, but unpleasant, you know. But it was something I, wa I felt I wanted to go into, you know, into that whole, uh, like a hell, you know, and into that place and to explore it and to see what it felt to be there, uh, which is something that I don't consider uh, has been felt before uh, when we see those, that, this type of violence of drug cartels and corruption that is happening now. Yeah. Not necessarily exactly like that, but I did want to show um, these, you know, in a way, vulnerable people, you know, uh, because the people that are being paid to commit these violent acts, they're, they're not that they're, you know, good people. I mean, that's it's not that's not it. But but they are humans, you know, and that's the scare. That's the most scary thing for me. You know, they're not monsters. They're sometimes it's even children, as in the film, you know, and that's truth. And um, uh, in Mexico, for example. Um, people that have seen the film have not, uh, nobody could ever say, why do you show that? I don't think that's true. You know, nothing like that is in the film. But yeah, it, the, the, it is actually, uh, sadly, if you see it very coldly, it is work that they're doing, you know, and they're ma making uh, um, money uh, because they don't have money. And it's not easy. Uh, the, the system in Mexico doesn't work very well economically. Uh, we have, for example, the richest man in the world here, and also some of the poorest people in the world. So whenever you have those two extremes in one place, I think in between that there's many things that are not going to be working, uh, and the way that it's not working so well in Mexico, uh, because many people, um, they don't have to resort to that, but they're vul vulnerable, so they end up doing these things because they know no other option, no better thing has been taught to them, you know, and has to do also with many things, with education, with with being born from a mother of 12 or 13 years old, uh, that happened, that is actually part of the film also, uh, and so there's many you know, elements of, uh, of, uh, of the problem that could be discussed, but at the end, uh, 
it just becomes uh, just that, just vulnerable and you want to make money and so you do that, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's maybe at the end uh, any, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe it's, uh, you have to be like really, really uh, a settled character to, to, to not fall. A what? A what? Uh, yeah, a strong, ah. I don't know, maybe a strong mm -hmm. character to, to stay on the other side, yeah. so to say, I don't know. Yeah, 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 well, yeah I think, uh, you know, we, we never know exactly how we're going to react towards very difficult things in life, you know? And sometimes w the fear of it is bigger than the actual uh, action when it happens, you know? Um, so conf Ellie is confronted with a very strong situation and uh, the way he reacts uh, to that is, is maybe not exactly what we would expect always someone to react, you know? Um, But yeah, uh, it is difficult, of course, to stay strong, to not become uh, a drug dealer or someone like that, no? Yeah, I don't know about that exactly. <laughs> um, but you, you decided not to, to show or to, to indi individualize a li like a villain person. Mm -hmm. Uh, one person only, no? Like for example, like uh, yeah, like, to a, not, like a character yeah. who's like a mm -hmm. um, antithesis of yeah, Ellie yeah. or something. Yeah, um, I guess it's in a way the the and the the enemy would be uh, the situation, you know, There's the situation that surrounds him, that that he feels fear from, and that is actually has been effective in destroying his family, you know. Um, but yeah, there's no individual. Uh, person even when there is some bad people you don't even see their faces in a way you know and it's interesting that you say that because yeah the the people that actually inflict the most physically violent part to 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 Ellie in a way i see them and i think there's a feeling that they're not they're also victims of a, of, of something else you know and that's uh, something interesting for me because it isn't so clear and, and, and nothing is so easy as to say there's bad people and there's good people, you know. Mm. But, uh, the, the, the director of photography was Lorenzo Hagerman. And uh, yeah, I don't know, we, we, I do a storyboard very detailed of everything before the film. And I show the story buddy because it's difficult for me to explain each shot. And, and then always when we're filming, we think of new things and I always made sure that at least one time a day at least we came up with a new idea and a new shot that wasn't in the movie that wasn't in the storyboard you know or in the anywhere in the script and in that and many of the uh, things that are in the film some of them not many but some are uh, improvised uh, in the moment you know for example in the burning scene uh, I, I, I think you mean the shot with the fire Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, for example, right. like that, just a shot that we decided to do there that wasn't planned. And also when there's a child that is uh, playing with the microphone, uh, that he gets up there to try to speak or something, that's also improvised. And um, many uh, camera movements sometimes are improvised. You know, I tell the cinematographer, I signal to him to move the camera somewhere. And I like to do those things, you know. Um, Yeah, so it helps me, even though I do have very strict idea from the beginning, I purposely, we try to get away from that. Uh, because it's good to have a good idea and a uh, stable idea, clear idea, uh, but it's also, it can be also not so good because then you don't do anything new and you don't surprise yourself, which is very important for me to surprise myself every every day, hopefully. And when I'm making a movie, it has to be full of uh, surprises. That's when I know Uh, that something interesting can maybe come out because whenever if everything came out the way I thought it um, I don't know I don't know how it would be but it would be d impossible I think in the first place so I tried to to look for mistakes and look for uh, things that that will change everything that I thought you know before and embra embrace those things was it also the case with the, the yeah maybe most talked about seeing the, the torture moment Uh, some scenes is not so easy to improvise because it has elements of special effects that have to be planned and, and etc. But um, there, it was very difficult to shoot those scenes uh, because we were many days in a room 
with uh, quite a few actors in the crew and uh, very uncomfortable. So I, I don't remember if we improvised so much. We weren't so fresh there at that moment. And also, uh, at some point there was a gas leak, you know, it was, there was some gas and we didn't notice. And we started to all get dizzy and headache and, uh, and it was a very unpleasant uh, time. <laughs> but we, we were able to uh, notice that and let it, the air go out and then we kept filming later. But, uh, but that reflects the surreal quality of the scene somehow. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, many things actually are a bit improvised, yeah. Um, because the, the actors are, have never acted before, these ch this young, very young guys that are there. Uh, so uh, it was difficult to tell them exactly what to say because they wouldn't, didn't come out so easily, you know. So uh, we had to, that also, that's why also it was difficult with them to work. That, that's just, that actually is something that the guy, I didn't write that actually, the guy said that, you know, this is an inquisition and it sounded, uh, you know, it, intellectual or something, it sounded interesting and I left it there like that. Um, there's also another part that someone also improvised something about the conquest, like the, from Spain, uh, what was it? Uh, One guy says, "Now you were, now you're going to learn what it's like to be uh, uh, an Indian in the land of uh, God, you know, something like that." Which to me sounded like something that a Spanish person would say when they came to Mexico first, uh, you know, 500 years ago. And these are lines that I heard and there that were recorded actually, and I I put them in the film uh, by the sound only, you know. Yeah, but yeah, those are things that sounded. Uh, interesting to me. <laughs> so not to give like a historical echo or something like that? Um, no, not so much, but it somehow made sense in a way to me, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, 500 years is not so much that time, if you see the history of the world. And um, what, what has been happening here from 500 years to now is still, if you see here, it's very obvious. Uh, you see that the indigenous people are the servants of the Spanish Uh, white-skinned people in Mexico still uh, so uh, and it's you know it's it's also for me it's that's very impressive still and it's still it brings up many uh, um, contrary emotions you know to, to see that uh, that how slowly things change you know from the it sounds a bit ridiculous because the conquest happened a long time ago when the Spain the Spanish came But if anybody comes to Mexico, you can clearly see the the conquest still very much here. <laughs> And so that's yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Do you also like feel, however uh, irrational uh, it might be, some sense of guilt or something like that? Um, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, actually, the, uh, maybe this goes away from the subject a bit, but the, a, a big point of my films, all of them, is the guilt of the characters. You know. Uh, that's always been an important part of the, of them, and I have uh, thought that you know, that of course, I have uh, a lot of guilt of something. I'm sure, and I, ha I have put them, put that into my characters in, in my films. Uh, my last movie, Los, no, my previous film, Los Bastardos, it ends with the character alone, uh, full of guilt, a lot of guilt, you know. And the, my first film, uh, Sangre, uh, the main character. Uh, is you know exploding from guilt and at the end uh, this takes him to a uh, very extreme situation because of his guilt of how he managed life you know and now in Ellie um, I, I'm not you know it's uh, I, it's maybe too new for me to analyze exactly but I think if you know if, if someone looks at it I'm sure it has those elements still in it you know I mean, at the end, he also commits the murder. Yeah, 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 and and, and he feels yeah exactly because uh, the, I think he did, he does feel guilty, of course, of what he did because in a, it's many people's faults what happened to this his family, but if you can an, if you analyze it coldly, some of the things he did were you know sort of direct reaction of what of all the tragedy that happens. You know, but, yeah. Just maybe one more question to the... Uh, yeah. Uh, 
um, in the torture sh scene, the, the, the framing you did um, with the, yeah, the, the hitting in the foreground and in the background, this computer game where the something like the same or similar scene mm -hmm. is, is mirrored. Why did you do that? <laughs> Um, you know, to tell you the truth, it, it wasn't so thought that, you know, which sounds not too interesting, but that's the way movies are a little bit. Uh, you film things and sometimes you don't notice it and then it becomes real once you see it in the screen, you know. But the idea of them playing video games originally was because I thought, well, if these guys, sometimes they get a lot of money, what are they going to be doing? They're going to buy a big TV and a, a, a video game and they're going to be playing it and playing it a lot when they're not doing anything else. So that's why I had the video game there originally. And then, um, and then uh, for practical reasons, when they start to, to torture the guys, uh, they instead of, they just sit down and they don't, they just pause, well, they don't even pause the video game, they just leave it there and it stays there and we see it a lot. But um, yeah, uh, there's no explicit message there exactly, you know. <laughs> about the violence in the video game and real life, no. I, I don't believe in that so much either, you know. But, and that's why maybe it wasn't so good to have that combination with the guys in the video game hitting. Uh, but it's the game that they would play and, you know. You know, not all policemen are bad and not everybody is corrupt and everything, but uh, it's like a virus that has really infected everywhere, uh, even schools, everywhere, it's corruption and uh, it's almost a tradition now. No? So uh, people don't trust the police, um, uh, you don't depend on the police really, and, and that's something that I had to show in the film because I couldn't you know, lie so much. But for a given example, uh, I was just told uh, recently uh, very young child, uh, 12 years old, they're doing these tests in school now um, for the state, you know, for the, to see the level of education of each school and for etc. You know? um, and so this kid told me directly that the teacher was uh, giving them the answers to the test you know, that they had to do because otherwise if they, um, if they did bad in the test he would get uh, uh, fired or scolded or something, the teacher. So the teacher told them, don't tell anybody, I'm going to give you all the, 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 uh, the answers to these tests, you know. And, and that was a, a surprise for me, of course, because for, even from the very start, there's, always, there's already, by the teacher being taught, this corruption, you know. Um, so it's sad, yeah. <laughs> so people don't feel responsible anymore for yeah, exactly. society or... Um, yeah, uh, there's a loss of uh, respect, I think, you know, in, uh, uh, in general. But not only in Mexico, probably, but here, with the corruption, uh, it has been really, I think, uh, detrimental to, to the way people live, you know. Um, the situation right now seems to be very bad, the, the drug war escalating and... Although, I don't know, since we have come here, we, it feels yeah. quite, quite normal, quite, yeah. <laughs> quite relaxed, I don't know. Um, but I, I was wondering when, although, you, as you just said, you were, it's a tradition, the, the corruption or something, mm -hmm. but was there a special moment when you realized that, oh my God, now it's, it's really getting worse? And, uh, well, no. Uh, the violence, of course, is not uh, pre present everywhere, you know. It's mainly, for the normal citizen, is mainly present in the news. That's where you see it. Because it's, uh, and also in Mexico City, it's quite, uh, Mexico City for me is almost like a different country, you know, because I usually live in Guanajuato, uh, which is a town five hours away, and here in, in, in Mexico City, um, it's so much, uh, it's very different. Uh, it's, it's like an international city, you know. And they have taken care of that in a way, and for many reasons, uh, they have not let it uh, become such a uh, 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 mess, you know. <laughs> but there's many other places where really uh, there's no law almost anymore, you know. The, the law has been taken uh, to, the, in the, to the hands of, it, of the citizens. And this is a phenomenon now, recent, more recent phenomenon, 
phenomenon that is coming of uh, group, militia groups that are even making their own jails uh, to get the the robbers or the person that did something in the town and and this is very uh, uh, it goes against the constitution so they send the army there and uh, they try to stop the situation but that's how far it has become of uh, the dependence on the police and the law you know um, and that's the way it is now um, about the, the yeah of course in Mexico City you're not going to really be encountered with with much of that or even in my town in Guanajuato it doesn't happen my town is a tourist uh, place, Guanajuato. Uh, but many towns in, in the country are very affected by that, you know. Uh, they are not uh, the big cities. Uh, but even some big cities like uh, Monterrey and, uh, and Nuevo León, uh, I know they have been affected. And many people don't go out in the streets at night and things like that, you know. Uh, luckily, I have not been directly involved with any situation, but uh, it's Unless, the, unless there's many people organized and lying, it is happening. <laughs> I mean, it's obvious, I mean, all the, the, the situation. So you have not seen like a corpse lying in the field mm. or something? No, 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 no. <laughs> I have seen corpses, but not by, they're killed by, by, uh, by, um, by cars mainly in Mexico. Maybe that's also a big uh, uh, percentage of death in Mexico is by cars also, you know, because of the, The roads are very bad, and <laughs> all the time there's either buses that are crashing and many people die, or people being run over. Um, what I always remember in Mexico is uh, many dogs uh, next to the road dead, you know. And I have seen about three or four people dead uh, next to the next to the roads also. Uh, of course, there's someone there taking, covering them, and it's not like a dog, you know. But uh, it happens a lot in Mexico, and it has to do with uh, corruption also, I'm sure, because. Um, things are not done uh, thoroughly, you know. They, whenever someone can find a chance to to cut uh, in the spending or to save money or or to be bribed of something, it happens and it affects every single part of society, even the building of a road, or, or for example, you know. So that's how much I think corruption has uh, affected the infected the whole country. You were mentioning the, the relations of uh, Mexicans to, to death, and um, I mean that this we can see also uh, here that uh, there is this celebra celebratory uh, or this humorous uh, mm -hmm. approach. Uh, even I don't know. There is a skeleton, sit, uh, like a plastic skeleton, mm -hmm. sitting on a bike uh, on the roadside, or mm -hmm. the sweets uh, you have mm -hmm. on the Day of the Dead. Or um, so I was wondering. Now with this other situation, with this different um, um, kind of death every day, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's just, I, I think it's really, it must be really a challenge to, to this humorous approach mm -hmm. or to... I, I think it's uh, somehow different, uh, you know, the both things. I think this, uh, the, the cult to the death that there is, which is somewhat religious, somewhat uh, esoteric also. Um, it's probably healthy, that part, you know. I think it's, it's, it's good to not take death so seriously, you know, uh, which is, I think, very good. That doesn't mean necessarily that we're going to be killing each other because we think it's funny or anything like that. But uh, so somehow I think it's separate. It's uh, similar to Halloween, I think, that, uh, that part, you know, <laughs> this, uh, this cult to the death. Even there's a there's a new uh, I don't know if it's a religion but there's this thing you know for the Santa Muerte which is like this skull with a, a big uh, knife or something that many taxi drivers hang in their taxis and somehow you you uh, it's for good luck that I think it's the idea is for death not to come to you or something like that you know but yeah there's something kind of dark and funny about that, those things you know. <laughs> But uh, that doesn't interest me so much, that, those, those things, because I think it's, in any way, it's good, you know, to not see death as such a taboo or such a thing that should be so hidden from reality, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah. I, I, so is it helpful to cope with the situation now? or is it? I'm not sure. For me, really, I'm a filmmaker, and it's difficult for me to analyze that social uh, part of the country, you know. But... I don't think it has so much, to, for ex at least I don't think it has, the situation that there is 
uh, I, I doubt that it has something to do with that other situation somehow, you know, um, uh, because I was reading a history book now also of how when the, again, when the Spanish came and the conquest, it was very violent and very uh, sadistic and uh, cutting off heads also, cutting off everything in the revolution. Uh, and m many countries have a very hi strong history of violence uh, that happens. Um, and that, that doesn't make the people now of that country extremely violent, you know? Um, so I'm not sure, it's complicated, I think. <laughs>
So in a way, it would be kind of the international generation, maybe, if anything, you know? That's, I just thought of that now, but I, I, I think, you know. With Ellie in particular, yeah, with yeah. Um, I think with Ellie, I wanted to people that saw it to see the closely how near the way I see things. You know, that's how every movie I made has been. So, with that always in mind, I try to not uh, be very pushy with any type of message I'm trying to give. Uh, and I, I want to, even though it's very difficult, uh, in a way. Uh, as long as my point of view is seen there, and I'm someone that I feel is uh, not so much in either side of things, you know, uh, and that way I feel uh, I'm um, I'm safe doing these films that are not going to be uh, giving a very strong message to one side, you know, because I believe very much in uh, that ambiguity is important. Uh, ingredient in in art and in making movies especially uh, so I'm, I'm careful to have enough ambiguity in in my films uh, some you know some people maybe don't see it that way because maybe their point of views are not ambiguous and they're very clear of what they think so when you show them something that is not clearly to one side or another they will take it to their side you know I feel I am very inspired by uh, Nuri Bilge Jailan, who is a Turkish director, you know. I actually, uh, my last film before this one, Los, Los Bastardos, was edited by uh, his editor, Turkish editor, you know. And these things happen because of internationalism, I guess, because I can uh, contact uh, the, the someone from very far away, you know, and, or, um, uh, yeah, to be exposed to very different people and very different films has been a, a somewhat of a new phenomenon. Of course, before you could also uh, go to a, a cinema, cine club and see foreign films and etc. But now it's a bit different, I think. And uh, how did you get in touch with the editor of Nuri I was actually, I was living in Turkey, that's why. <laughs> For, I lived there two years uh, and uh, I edited Los Bastardos there, my film. And I contacted him and he was very nice. Uh, Ayhan Ergursel is his name. And it was he didn't speak uh, sp uh, Spanish or English, and I didn't speak Turkish. Um, but he uh, we, we, he said that he was able to work with me through the language of cinema. So <laughs> and it was really good experience. He was a really good editor, and it was very good. You know. Yeah. Okay. But uh, so you did with, like drawings or? Uh, no, he actually also didn't know how to use the program to edit. Even <laughs> he was used to cutting film only. You know. But he would tell me, and uh, um, we also had some translation, of course. And he and uh, between uh, us three people that were working there, uh, were able to communicate enough to to do it. It is very visual to edit, you know. And he would edit by the emotions of the actors, and uh, it was a good experience, interesting experience, because he was editing a movie from very far away from him, and he had a different view of it than me, so it was helpful, you know. Um, yeah, last question, what is uh, the greatest thing about cinema for you? The greatest thing about cinema? <laughs> mm, well, I think it, uh, you know, what comes to my mind is that you, there's a square there, there's a world that you create inside there, that is uh, where anything can happen, really, and you can, create all these uh, emotions and uh, tell a story and make people scared and make people cry and laugh. Uh, I mean, it's just basically telling, uh, showing people and telling people something that is, uh, in my case, inside for me, that's, I think is amazing, you know, and it never stops uh, surprising me, the, this magic. <laughs> I think it's a kind of magic uh, cinema, you know.